Well, it's good to see everybody. It's good to see everyone. Um, you ready to get into God's Word? I've been excited to do that all week, to come and share God's Word with you. So if you would, um, pick up a Bible. I hope that you have one. Uh, if you don't and you'd like to have one, uh, there's lots of blue ones here. Hey, what's up, brother? You good? Good to see you. Um, lots of blue Bibles here. And uh, if you don't have one, go ahead and just grab one of those and take it home with you. And uh, that's our gift from Revolution to you. And uh, we hope that you'll use it and it'll bring you many years of joy. Um, we're going to read uh, today, our, our, we're going to find ourselves in southern Greece. We're going to uh, continue our study, the, this series called The Healthy Body, as we study the body of Christ and how it is to conduct itself um, we, we started the first week talking about the, the personal, one-on-one, just me, my drift, your drift, how we tend to drift towards our default sin. We just, it's our sinful nature to do that, you know? And so the scriptures tell us that, and we also have all experienced that, haven't we? All, when I asked you, raise your hand. Yeah, I did that. When I quit reading, I stopped going to church, I stopped praying so much, and all of a sudden I found myself in a bad place, and we've all experienced that, and, and uh, we don't want to do that. Uh, so we learned from the scriptures how to avoid that. We've got to kind of um, beat our body into submission sometimes, right? To put ourselves in a place where God can speak faith into us. You know, we find that faith uh, from hearing the word of God. And so whether it's you reading it yourself or if I'm reading it to you or you're, you're reading a book that speaks of the scripture and gives you perspective on it or you're online looking or watching a, a, a sermon from your favorite pastor, you know, uh, that's the place you need to be to put yourself into those places where God can pour faith into you uh, or otherwise we're, we're kind of going to drift off. We, we covered that. Then we kind of talked about um, trans, trans, uh, moving from, from, from me to we, the body of Christ. And so we talked a little bit about that last week. We went to, uh, into the book of Galatians and we talked about how they, they were saved by grace you know, nothing they did to earn it, but then all of a sudden, instead of living under that same grace that saved them, they started to try to perform, and it was religious duties in, in the church, that they were trying to get more like Jesus by going through religious activities, and instead of remembering that it was by grace that saved you, and it's by grace that you will continue to progress in your faith and become more like Christ. And so this week, we're going to we're going to venture into uh, southern Greece, and we see this letter that Paul wrote uh, to the church in Corinth. He wrote several letters to these folks. Uh, some people think that it was in response to letters that they had sent him, asking him questions about this and that going on in the church. Uh, he planted this church. It was going well, and then it kind of went sideways. And uh, many years ago, I preached a series uh, in in 1 Corinthians, and it was a long, long series, and the reason why it was a long series is because this church, if you read this book, 1 Corinthians, you're going to see there's lots of stuff to talk about. They were a really messed up church. People were getting drunk on communion wine. There's one dude having sex with his stepmother and, and, and bragging about it to the church. It, it, they, they, the, the, the worship service was chaotic. They were using their spiritual gifts like, like crazy people. It, it was just a, a mess. They were suing each other. There was all kinds of problems. And so Paul wrote this letter to the church in Corinth to, to correct them. Uh, I'm not going to teach the whole book tonight. I'm going to, what I thought, spend a week in Corinth. I'm going to probably spend five. Uh, but we'll start here tonight and see what where their drift was and and hopefully we won't do the same thing right and that's why this has sovereignly been placed in scripture so that we would read it and, and not go oh I can't believe them no it's oh I don't want to be them that's why it's there and so we're going to venture in we're just going to kind of go right through the text it's nothing I don't have to use a lot of creativity it's all right there I want to invite you to open your Bibles of course to first Corinthians and right in chapter one, and this is what we do here at our church, most often we just go through scripture and let God's word speak to you. So I want to invite you there. I'm going to read, do some reading here with you tonight, and then uh, we'll tear into it a little bit as we go along. But let me read with you first, uh, the first nine verses. And I'm just going to start by saying that he, he greets the people. This is the apostle Paul. 
And, and it says here in verse 1 that not only is it him, but it's his, bu- his buddy Sosthenes. I don't know anything about Sosthenes other than it's a cool name. So um, there's no mention of him that I know of anywhere else in Scripture, but Paul's with this guy, Sosthenes, and, but we know that it was not just Sosthenes that wrote it. It was actually Paul who literally penned this letter, although a lot of times back in the day when people wrote in the Bible, when they wrote the Word of God, there was an amanuensis. It was like a secretary, if you will, someone you would dictate to, and they would write it down. But in this case, at the end of the letter, you'll see that Paul actually puts a greeting down, he says, in his own writing. This is actually me writing this, not Sosthenes. Sosthenes is hanging out with me, but this is me writing it. So that's verse one. Verse two, let let me just start reading. I am writing to God's church in Corinth, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, just as he did for all people everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you. Now that you belong to Christ Jesus, I read that wrong. Let me read it again. I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. That was better, right? Through him, God has enriched your church in every way. With all your eloquent words and all of your knowledge, this confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says and he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So let me just kind of rip this thing apart a little bit, make a point, and, and really tonight I'm going to talk about uh, really one drift. There's one drift that this church does in this section of Scripture, but it's kind of broken up into two parts, okay? Um, but before we get to those, I just want to tell you, I just want to kind of break down this, this opening section. Uh, the first thing is, is this, that you, we all have to understand, and you need to get this, it's very, very important. It's that, it, it's that God made you holy, that it was God's grace that made you a Christian. It was, it, was, it was last week that I pounded this verse, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. I want to pound it again, and that is, it was by grace that you were saved. It was not anything, it was when you believed. It was, he saved you out of his kindness, out of his generosity. It was not that you earned it or deserved it or you were looking for it. When he moved upon your heart and you realized you needed a savior and you believed that Jesus was the Christ who went to the cross for your sin, it was by his kindness that he just said, okay, you believe that? I'll save you. It was his grace that saved you. God made you holy. Now, I want you to see here that he's, not just talking about that church, because if we're just talking about Corinth and we're not talking about revolution, then we're missing the point. He says, he's writing to God's church in Corinth, to you who have been called by God to be his own holy people. He made you holy by means of Christ Jesus, right here in verse two. He says, just as he did for all people everywhere who call on the name of the Lord. And so this letter, Revolution, listen, it's written to you. I don't know what other churches have taught you, but here's the simplicity of the gospel, and sometimes this is where people stumble. The scriptures say in Romans that all those who call upon the Lord will be saved. That if you, if you confess, if you speak out out of believing in your heart that Jesus is your Lord, then you're saved. And so anyone who's done that, who's, there's a, a genuine conversion of the heart, and you believe that Jesus is Lord, then you are saved. This letter is written To you, so he's written to Corinth and it's written to revolution. Here's the next point. It's not only did he save you by his grace, but he's growing you by his grace. You'll see it right here in the text. Look at verse three. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Now, that only makes sense if you realize that what he said before is that by his grace, he saved you. And now he's saying not only did he save you originally, the first move towards you was his move. And now it says here, moving forward. 
Paul says, and now may God give you grace. So, so any, the, the initial move was God giving you grace. And any, any move forward in your walk with Christ is also God doing it. God is doing it. It's by his grace that you will grow. So now look here in verses 5, 6, and 7. Here's the amazing thing about this church. I would say it's a good church. Paul says of this church, I always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. You see right there in verse 5, he's enriched your church. We didn't do it. Remember I told you last week, I stressed this too, that God, speaking of the body of Christ, that God placed you together perfectly here at Revolution, that he brought you here, that there's nothing wrong with this church, that it's good and perfect because God did it, and he don't make no junk. That was a good amen spot, okay? Want me to give you another chance? God don't make no junk. That's it, that's it, church. So because he says that everything's been placed together perfectly, we know it makes sense now when Paul says he's enriched your church. And he kind of goes on, he says what the enrichment was. He did something. He, he placed this together uh, in every way with all your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. This confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. And I would say that this confirms what I told you about Christ is true. That God placed us together perfectly. But here's the thing, once he places you together perfectly, which he has, because God's not a liar, he doesn't make junk, the next part of the verse is, is, is it, the first part was his, now it's on you. He placed you together perfectly. Now as each person does his own special work, it helps the others to grow. And then the whole church is healthy, growing, and full of love. So that's the perfect church. He, 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 he put us together. He wants to see some results out of what he's done. And if we will step in and do what he's asked us to do, you will see a healthy, growing church. And that's what he wants. And he goes on to say that he's given us every spiritual gift. It's right there in verse 7. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you er eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. I was thinking about that about enriching our church and every spiritual gift that we need. In today's context, they didn't have buildings like this back then, you know. It was a little different. I started thinking about the ways he's enriched our church. You start thinking about the surface things, you know, the building. It's nice, right? It's nice. Speakers are good. They, they sound pretty good. Air conditioning. Do you want some air conditioning? I was told it was very cold. You see why I don't touch it? Half of you yelling, it's cold, and half tastes great, less filling. Uh, yeah. So, so, what's that? I'm not, hey, I'm not getting, you want to get in that fight? You want to jump in that shark tank? Okay, listen, Jessica's turning it on. You want to have a problem, you take it up with Jessica Murata. I dare you. <laughs> uh, so, so I started thinking about that, though, seriously, about all the things that he's done, the building, the equipment, air conditioning, comfy seats, and all that kind of stuff. But really, the church is more than that, you know? It's about the people. And so when he says that he's building a, a perfect church, placed it all together perfectly, it's, it, these are just icing on the cake, this, this stuff. You know what it is? It's you. It's you. He placed us together perfectly. And, and all the spiritual gifts that he's talking about, They've, he's deposited it in you. Do you know the Bible tells us that when you bend the knee to Christ, at that very moment, Ephesians 1.13 says that he has placed his Holy Spirit inside of you. And along with the gift of the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit also gives you some type of gifting, some type of talent, ability, something that you can do to build, to, to live out what he says about each person doing their own special work. That's the gift he wants you to use for his glory so the whole church is growing. And so this, these words of Paul here were, were good words to a good church, right? He said, you've, you, God's enriched it. I thank God for you. It's a good church. Corinth, you're a good church. And Revolution, I would say also, you are a good church. You're a good church because you're good people. And God's, God's grace is upon you. And it's upon us. And that's why you're all here. 
But you see this beautiful relationship here? That's what I want you to see next. You see the beautiful relationship that's on display here. We talked about it last week, this relationship between you and God, that there's some things he's going to do, but then there's some things that you need to do as well, personal responsibility. Look what it says here in verse eight. He says, he's talking about all these things that God has done, and he's, and he's, gonna, he's gonna equip you with all the spiritual gifting you need as you wait for the day that Jesus comes back. I don't know, it could be at the end of the sermon, it could be the end of the sentence, it could be another thousand years, but look what he's, the promise here is that everything that's in the church right now, revolution, it's, it, we have everything we need here right now to be an amazing church until the day Jesus Christ returns. In verse eight, you see God's part. He says, he, God, will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. So you see, there, there's this part that God does. He'll keep you strong. He'll keep you strong. Remember we talked about this last week, the, the promise that God gave us, the, the amazing number one promise, the best promise he ever gave anyone was the, the, the promise of, God, of his own Holy Spirit living inside the believer. The other ones are what I'll do for you. This one's what I'm gonna do in you. I'm gonna give you my Holy Spirit. And he's gonna do some things. And so he's reiterating that right now, that God's at work inside of us, not only personally, but within the body of Christ to create something healthy, growing, and full of love. He says, verse 9, God will do this, for he's faithful to do what he says. And so you see God's part being done for sure. He's a, he's a promising God, and he keeps his word all the time. But now look at here, personal responsibility reiterated here. Remember, Paul said, I have to, to, to strike a blow to my body to, to make myself be obedient to the Lord. God's going to do some things, but I've got to put myself in position to receive faith. And look what it says here. He tells the folks in Corinth the same thing, and he'll tell it to you. Not only is God doing something, he says, but he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see, it's not just God doing everything. It's not just us, I'll do everything on my own like they were in Galatia. I, I, you saved me, you did your part, but now I'm gonna earn the rest. And he's like, no, it's not like that. God's gonna continue to do some things, but, but you need to continue to do some things as well. There's some personal responsibility. So there's this beautiful relationship between the, the God of creation and the, and the creation itself, man. And, and we work together in harmony to, to see this great result come about. This great promise of God working in us is, is again, the, the promise of the Holy Spirit. He initiates life. The moment we say yes, he, he, the reason why you can't die is because he's now in you. And see, Christ died and rose again. He will never die again. And his spirit lives inside of you. So because he can live forever and he will live forever, that means the believer will live forever. Nothing can stop that. But not only is he initiating new life, but once this new life is begun, he begins to transform this new life. Remember, we, we talked about that last week, that once we have faith, he's granted us this gift of faith, and this faith leads to moral excellence. This moral excellence leads to godly knowledge, and godly knowledge leads to self-control, and self-control leads to patient endurance, and patient endurance leads to godliness, and godliness leads to brotherly affection, and brotherly affection ultimately leads to love for all people. That's what the Holy Spirit does inside. The ongoing ministry of the Holy Spirit of God is to do this in you if you will put yourself in position to receive faith from him. And then he'll do the rest. We make the choice, he makes the change. There's more that the Holy Spirit does. If you would like to, to jot this reference down, you don't necessarily have to go there if you want, but Galatians 5.22 tells us that this same Holy Spirit, when he takes up residence inside of you and he is given frequent uh, access to your thoughts and to your heart and your soul and your motives and your perspectives and you let him do his work, he will create inside of you love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. This is the ongoing work of God's Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. So this is a good church. Corinth was a good church. And revolution, you're a good church. But, like most often, because we're 
of a sinful bent too often, we drift. And so it started out good here in Corinth, it kind of went sideways. And, and, and our challenge here is to make sure that we are aware that this could happen, what they did, so that we can guard against it. So we would not be like this because we want to be healthy, growing, and full of love. Amen? So, so we want to avoid their drift. So here's the drift. It was a good church, but in verse 10, something happens. You there? Are you there? Okay. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, there's some strong wording coming up, you ready? By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what's really funny about that? The scriptures say that all the word of God is inspired by God. But yet Paul, under the sovereign movement of this Holy Spirit, he has to reiterate something. Listen up. That's what he's saying. Listen up under the authority of Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there, be, let there be no divisions in the church. No divisions in the church. The country's filled with church splits. I heard of another one yesterday. And it breaks my heart, and I'm sure it breaks the heart of God and I'm sure the pastor of the flock there that poured his life into those people only for them to say sayonara. Let there be no division in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. Do you see the affectionate words of Paul? Do you see how he's, he's repeating himself about brothers and sisters? He's trying to get a point across. Brothers and sisters. Do brothers and sisters just split in a blood family because we disagree? We're not supposed to, right? You stick with it. How many people get along with their family all the time? No one. Liar. But do you run? Dear brothers and sisters, why did he repeat this twice? He's trying to make a point. Stick with it. Some of you are saying I am a follower of Paul who's writing this. Others are saying I follow Apollos and, or I follow Peter or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. Goes on, talks a little bit about baptism. He didn't do any of the baptism, really, except for a couple of people. I don't remember any baptizing anyone else, he says in verse 16. Verse 17, for Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. So what's the Corinthian drift we'll talk about tonight? It's just this one thing. It's, it's division. It's division in the church. And what's he say about division? How many, how many divisions does he want? None. 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 Two things, two ways he talks about division here. We need to guard against it. If we're going to be the church that God wants us to be till the day Christ returns, you got to pay attention. Two things that we divide over. The first one is thought and purpose. You'll see it right there in, in the text. Be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. That's the, that's the why and the way. Why, why, why are we here? And, 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 and how do we conduct ourselves as a church? What do we what do, we do with, with this thing called the church? That's thought and purpose. And the second one is personalities. You see, he says, some follow Paul, some follow Apollo, some follow Peter, some say, I only follow Jesus. These were two ways that the church was dividing. Let's talk about the first one, this thought and purpose. Uh, in 1646, church leaders gathered, and, and they didn't rewrite scripture, and I'm going to tell you the, about something, and don't say, well, he's going Catholic. I'm not Catholic. 
There's a word in it that might make the Catholic, the, 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 the one who was Catholic may start to cringe or where are the kneelers? It's not happening. But in 1646, church leaders got together and they put together this thing called the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Now again, it's not the Bible. But what they attempted to do was to, to take our faith, this big book that we have, and kind of melted down a little bit so people could, could say, hey, what's with this Christianity? And you could kind of explain it in, a, in a simple terms. And, it, and it, that's why the Westminster Shorter Catechism, hence the name. And so they try to, to, to boil this, this faith down so we could understand it. And so this is what they started out with. They asked this question. It was the first thing I read it. It says, what's the chief end of man? In other words, like, wh- wh- why am I here? What's the purpose of, anyone ever ask those questions? You have those big questions like, you know, why am I here? What's the meaning of life kind of thing? I don't know how you phrase it, but it's the big question. Like, why, why do I even exist? And then, of course, not only why do I exist, but now as people, individuals get together, why does the church exist? And this was their answer. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Listen, that's our faith. <laughs> Don't overcomplicate it. That's a great answer. To, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Now this, this shorter catechism goes on. The very next thing says this. What rule has God given to direct us in this endeavor? The answer, as it was written, was the word of God. That's what the answer was. How do we glorify God and enjoy him forever? Do what that says. That, that, that's it. That's it. The word of God gives us countless commands to follow, perspectives to align with, priorities to consider as we read the word of God. How do I, how do I view and use money? Uh, what, what's, what's, what's biblical marriage? What's real marriage? Who's it between? What's it mean? What's it do? How do we uh, raise our children? What's the best way to do it? How do I pray and, and for who and, and when should I pray? How should I conduct our, myself in a worship gathering? Uh, it talks about the holy sacraments, uh, which were two, two things that the, that the Lord gave us as gifts. Baptism, to remind us of the, of, the, of the resurrected Christ and that we are living in him. And as he has been raised to new life, so have you. And so baptism is an awesome gift. And then communion, where we remember the Lord. And we remember what he did for us on the cross and who we are in Christ and remembering him until he comes again. I would offer to, to you this, and I believe that it is true, that one that follows the word of God will glorify God and enjoy him and enjoy a good life. And those that choose not to, it will not go so well. And we've all experienced that. The word of God will also tell us what to do with this God. If we've received him into our life, what do we do do with this God now that that we have him? Now that we're glorifying him, what would we do with him? As a matter of fact, the, the scriptures would even go on to say that there's a crucial element involved in your relationship with God that if you do not allow this element into your walk with him, you cannot enjoy him fully. And so maybe this is for you. Maybe this is your word right now. And that is to share what you found. Hence the invitations. Look what I found. Remember the lady at the well. She runs into Jesus. Her life is a mess. Anyone was there? I was. And he saved me. He saved me. And that's why I have to get up and tell people about him. He saved me. And this woman, she's saved by Jesus. A woman that's shunned by everyone in town and she's saved by Jesus and she runs back into town and she says, come and meet the one who told me everything I ever did. She had to share him with the people. (laughs) In Acts 4.19, Peter and John say, how can we not tell of what we've seen and heard? Paul himself in this letter in in chapter 9, verse 16 says, I'm compelled to preach. I can't help it. Woe to me if I don't. Like, he, he, when he wakes up in the morning, it's not like, you know what? I, today, I'm going to share the Lord with someone. 
I've made that choice. Today I'm going to do that. No. He didn't even have to make the choice. He woke up and it's on his lips. Your praise will forever be on my lips. And he was compelled. He couldn't help it. Why? Because he loved Jesus. And Jesus had saved his life. And so when Jesus said, go make disciples of all nations and teach them all that I have taught you, Paul took it to heart. And he says, I'm compelled to preach. I believe, therefore I preach. And like I said, the word of God will say that there's a, this crucial element is needed for you to really fulfill what these guys at the Westminster Catechism said. To, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. 1 John 1, 4, John says, we are writing these things so that our joy will be complete. They realize that I cannot enjoy the Lord to the utmost, to, to receive all that he would have for me unless I tell other people about him. That's part of the package. I've got to tell. I've got to tell. So, so can I offer this, this uh, I guess it's just a, a summary then of, of the church's existence. If, if, if that's the, the, the chief end of everyone in this room is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, then as a church, if we could summarize it, couldn't we just say that the, that the why, being, being united in thought and purpose, the why is to know God and to make him known. Wait, we don't have to make it too complicated, right? It's just, it is what it is. That's why we exist. That's the chief end of all people. To give yourself over to him and to help other people to do the same. That is the why. That's why we exist. That's what we're to do with this life that we have. Now, within this ultimate scope of, of, ultimate, of, of united purpose, will we have personal preference? See, this is where we start to draw the, the battle lines in the church. And sometimes these battle lines aren't just like in pencil, they're in blood. Can we have personal preference within the church, within this united thought and purpose of existence? Can we have personal preference? Can we have hymns and bands? Can we have worship service at night? Or do we have to have it during the day? Can we dress up? Some people love to dress up. They, they want to they wanna wear their best for the Lord. Awesome. My opinion, it's not Bible. I don't think it gives a rip. But, but listen, if you think so, awesome. Do it. Dress up. Some people don't have dress clothes, don't care. I don't know that God really cares, but if you want to do it, it's okay. Dress up or casual. Sometimes people like visually and audibly passionate preachers. And sometimes they like a quiet, gentle man. There's good ones in both camps. Some people like the old school church buildings. They have to have the sunlight shining through, man. Let the light in. What are you doing with these curtains? Some churches like to have controlled lighting so they can do things. Blood <laughs> or pencil. Some people like, you know, big church, rocking church, mega church. Some people like small and intimate settings. Well, the scriptures would tell us in Philippians 2, 3, I would say if I was going to give you my version of Philippians 2, 3, it would be God don't care. He says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Fighting over superficial stuff, you ready? If you take notes, write this down, is stupid, is stupid. There's no reason for it. I'm fighting for, for strife is fighting over vain glory, you know, the superficial stuff that don't matter. Who cares? And I like it this way, and I'm going to fight for this. You don't do it my way, I'm on it. Leave. It's okay. The Bible says not to do that. Don't, don't fight over the, the superficial things that I like. I like it this way, I like it that way. It goes on to say, but instead, in humility, consider others better than yourself. 
So I've often said that you'll never get your feelings hurt if you're not thinking about your feelings. And in, and in the church, that's the way it's supposed to be. In the church of Jesus Christ, not just in the building, but in the church, in you people. We're supposed to, I, Hannah, you're more important than I am. Your preference is more important than mine. Nick, your preference is more important than mine. And my preference should be more important to you. So can you imagine a place where it was like that all the time? Can you imagine a husband and wife, the husband, that's all they wanted to do was do whatever made their wife happy. Wives, come on. Amen. You're getting ready to get married. If you don't say amen right now, you are crazy. <laughs> right? How about the other way around, husbands, you ready? What if the, your wife's main goal in life was to, to make you happy? You all are pathetic. That was it? You're the only one. You're scared. You're scared. <laughs> That's the way the church is supposed to be. Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Everything. It doesn't make any difference what these superficial things are. Hymns to the glory of God? I'm preaching myself and I hate hymns. I don't like hymns. Do other people like hymns? Do, does God like a, a hymn that's, that's, that's chock full of, of words that describe how awesome he is? He likes it, right? Well, I don't like it. Tough. Don't strive, no strife over vainglory. Full sounding band, maybe you like that to the glory of God. I don't like contemporary, it's too loud. Do other people like it? Maybe. You know, the scriptures tell us in Psalm 47, 1, come everyone, clap your hands, shout to God with joyful praise. So for all the people that don't like contemporary worship music, it's too loud, it's a, oh well, get over it. Get over it. The hymn guy, I'm gonna look in the mirror now. Get over it. <clears throat> Lots of new people, right? I like big church. I like big church. You start praying. God, who should I, who should I invite? You put someone in your heart, and you hand it to them, and they come. That'd be cool, right? Here. <clears throat> what happens if that person comes? People that don't like big church. What happens if that person comes and they experience something they've never experienced before? Because their, their job they hate, their neighbors are unfriendly, they can't stand their in-laws, and they walk in here and you all are nice to them. And they hear something out of this Bible that they go, oh, well, I didn't know Jesus was, was nice. I thought he was mean because all the rest of the Christians I met were mean, but you guys aren't mean. And he seems like he's a good God. And they like it, and they say, you know what, I, I, this is different than anything I've ever experienced. I'd like to come here and hang out with you guys, because you always seem to be smiling. And they come. And what happens, that, praise God, right? What, what, what happens if, if those people that you invited, they turn around and they do the same thing, and they invite someone, and that person comes in and goes, I like Frank's hat. He's a cool guy. I'm going to sit back there and hang out with him. Oh, Frank, you go here. I saw you last year in Mount Dora. You're a nice guy. I want to hang out with you. This is where you are on Saturday night? Yeah, it's cool. And they come in and they have some of Mary's cookies. Hey, this place is awesome. Is this heaven? I want to come here. Oh, there's more people. What happens if those people decide to pray and say, God, who should I invite? And they meet their neighbor next door. And the neighbor's miserable and they go through problems and they come here and they beg them, come on. God has something for you. He'll talk to you. And they show up. And it just so happens to be that, that the preacher's talking about exactly what they're going on in their life. Anyone ever been there when they're, this dude checking my mail or something, right? Yeah, I got news for you. I don't check anyone's mail. I go through Bible books. And, and so if there's a, a coincidence, that's him, not me. I'm stupid. He's smart. And those people start coming. Guess what? Awesome. Big church. Don't want to turn them away. 
Do you know the Bible tells us that he wants all people to be saved and to understand the truth? That's, uh, you know, all, that's a big number, isn't it? All's a big number. So, 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 but then some of us will drift off and go, yeah, we got to build a big monster, spend $30 million, get a loan, build it, they're coming, we got to fill it up. Woo! That's dumb. He's, that may be true, but you know, in Acts chapter 2, when the church started, some of the believers just met in houses. Yes. That was good too, right? Yes. Ain't nothing wrong with that. So, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe big churches are good and maybe small churches are good. Or, or maybe it's either or, or maybe it's both. There's an idea. Both. Both. See, if you, if you look at Paul's words there in, in chapter 1, verse 10, under the authority of Jesus, he says, let us live in harmony with each other. With, together, right? He, he doesn't want uh, a homogenized church where everyone's cookie cutter. You know those neighborhoods where every house is exactly the same? Who, who, like, some of us will live in it but, but, but how many people like that? Yeah, nobody, my house is like that. I like my house, but I'd rather not. But, but that, and that's the thing with God. Like he, he wants us to have harmony with each other. That means that you should, under the authority of the Lord Jesus, not me, under the authority of the Lord Jesus, he wants us to be different together. He doesn't want us to draw lines in blood and cause division. He's down with divisions and up with diversity. That's the church of Jesus Christ. So, so that's the first thing. It's, it's, it's this problem of thought and purpose. Like why? Why am I here and what are we supposed to do? Listen. Make God known. If you don't like something that goes on here because it's not your way, I don't, I love you. You got to get over it. Churches are splitting all the time, weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker over personal preference. And he says, don't strive, don't have strife over vainglory, but humbly give in so that other people are more important than you. It doesn't matter what you like. You know what? I'm not a metalhead. Several months ago, we had a Christian heavy metal night here. And it was packed. <clears throat> if they did, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a hip hop fan either. Pardon, I love you, but I'm not a hip hop fan unless it was like old school. Like I used to like run DMC, you know? I should have worn my Adidas. But, but I, I was into Run DMC and Nucleus and, and all those old guys, you know, Sugar Hill Gang. That was a good song. LL Cool J. Don't get, I'm, no, I'm not going to do it. Okay, so, <laughs> but I don't, I'm not into it anymore. Let me tell you something. If, if Michael got up and, 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 and did a song and, 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 and he's doing hip hop about Jesus, and people started to come down the aisle and give their life to Christ, guess what kind of music this church would be doing, whether you liked it or not? Right? Because why are we here? To know God and to make him known. It's not here to make me happy. Like, I'm not into country. Email me. I don't even care if you email me. Right? But listen... If Jared gets up with a banjo and starts strumming on his knee and start, people start coming to the Lord, guess what music we're going to hear here? We're going to listen to some bluegrass up in here. And I don't even care. I hate blue. I don't even know what. What is bluegrass? Like Dolly Parton or something? I don't even know what it is. But if that made people come to Christ, that would be what we do here. And I don't care what I like. And I don't care what you like. What makes God happy? You know what makes him happy? Right to the altar, a repented sinner, giving his life to him. That's all that matters. That's why the church exists. That's why it's here. So, so that's, that's the first thing. It's, it's, it's this united in thought and purpose. We've got to get together on this. Personal preference out the window. Pleasing the Lord. Here's the next division. It's just right there in the text. We're just going along with it. 
You see it right there in verse 12. Look at verse 12. Some of you are saying, I'm a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, and I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. I don't know, in this world. If, if someone said, um, I follow Mike, in this world, that's kind of a good thing, right? That means he's doing pretty good. Well, why is God saying this in here with the guy who's, Name it is. Paul's like, no, don't follow me. But that's division too. That's division. It's personalities. Some people follow this person. Some people follow that person. And that happens in churches too. You know, churches are being built on the dynamic personalities of these pastors, these amazing leaders, these incredible orators. You know, I don't know if it happens here too often. I've seen it a little bit. And it happens all over the country in churches where there's this dynamic leader, well-known dude who gets up every week and he belts out the word of God and and people flock to his church to hear this amazing oracle. And then they find out that Deshaun White's coming, a guest speaker, and they come on and the place is half empty because the preacher's not there. And that's what churches are being built on. And it's unfortunate because a good leader always points people to Jesus, not to himself. Never points to himself, always to Jesus. And Paul exemplifies this quality oh so well right here in the text. He's the guy who's writing the letter. And and what does he say? He goes, was I crucified for your sin? Was, Was I the one who willingly went up onto the cross and absorbed the full wrath of the creator for the sin of every single person? Such a mighty, mighty weight that it would sink the universe into hell. Was I the one who did that for you? No. Was Peter? No. Whose name were you baptized? How many people in this room... Not to praise Moses in, in any way, and you'll see what I mean. How many people have I baptized? Raise your hand. Have I, I've baptized you. Let me ask you a question. How many of you were baptized in the name of the Father, Moses, and the Holy Spirit? None. None. Paul's the same way. Who am I? It's not about me. It's not about me. Fix your eyes. In verse 17, he tells us, listen, it's not, it's, it's not, I, I'm nothing, man. I'm just a worker in the field. It doesn't make any difference. Billy Graham, right? Worker in the field. A.W. Tozer, worker in the field. Your fa- who's your favorite preacher? Tammy Faye. <laughs> Anyone, you name it. Worker in the field. Look in verse 17. Look what he says. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news. He's like, I'm not the end all. I didn't do it all. I, I, I didn't even, I'm not even supposed to be baptized. I'm just doing, I, he, Christ sent me. He's the, he's the one you should be looking at. I'm just doing my job. In Luke, it says that if we do our job for the Lord, we're just a humble servant doing our duty. And Paul's like, that's me. I, I wasn't sent as the end all. I'm just here to preach the good news. I'm just here to open my mouth and tell you about Jesus. And he says, I didn't even do it with clever speech. I don't want you to think I'm some fancy. I'm not up here you know, quoting Greek and, and he, ancient Hebrew text and look at me, look at how brilliant I am. No clever speech. I just told you about Jesus and, 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 and I'm just trusting that, that the word of God, that the Holy Spirit will, will just do something. Please, it's not about me. I don't want you to look at me because if you look at me, then, then, the, then the, Christ, the cross of Christ would lose its power. It's, it's about him. It's not a, about me. Praise the message, not the messenger. I'm just sent. I'm just the worker. He, Jesus Christ, is the one you need to fix your eyes on. Look at uh, chapter 3. This is such a big deal to this church. You can see how it's been dividing. He talks about it in, in chapter, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 3, verses 4. I'm just going to read some, some verses to you. Three, uh, four, 4 through 11, 
He says, uh, when, when one of you says, I'm a follower of Paul, and, and the other says, I'm a, I follow Apollos, aren't you acting just like people of the world? That's what people in this world, that's what our society does. We divide over stuff like this. But God said he's called us to be his holy people, to be different. Romans 12, 2, don't, don't conform to the image of this world. Don't, don't, com- don't, don't do like the rest of the world does. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but be different. Let him change the way you think. And that's what people in the world do. So don't, don't divide. Don't not come because your preacher, your favorite preacher is not behind the microphone. Because the chief end of the church is to glorify God, not you or a person. After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? That's amazing for the guy who's actually writing this. We are only God's servants through whom you believed the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your heart. Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. Remember the ongoing grace of the Spirit of God? That's it right there. It's not important. (laughs) He's he's ripping himself down. You see this? Less of me, less of me, less of me all the time. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose. Man, see how it all comes together? The people, the personalities, the the reason why we exist as a church, it's all to come together to to take our eyes off of each other and what we all want and back onto him. These amazing men of faith that I could never even, I couldn't even mow their lawns in heaven. And he's saying, I'm just a worker. We're just all in this together, man. It's not about me. It's not about him or her. It's about him. Get your eyes on him. Get your eyes on him. Look at chapter 2. First verse, when I came to you, this is Paul, he says, dear brothers, I I didn't even use lofty words or impressive wisdom to tell you God's secret plan, for I decided that while I was with you, I would forget everything, everything, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is the greatest evangelist, church planner, writer of scripture who's ever lived. And he said, I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling and my message and my preaching were very plain rather than using clever and persuasive speeches I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit I did this so you would not trust in human wisdom but in the power of God always shrinking the messenger down Paul's oh ever shrinking, 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 shrinking. Don't look at me, the writer of Hebrews said, to fix your eyes on Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, not on any man who stands in a pulpit. But the the funny thing is that Paul, in the same letter, in the 11th chapter, he says, follow me. Kind of contradicting, right? Follow me. He says, don't follow me. He goes on, he says, follow me. But then there's a comma, and he says, follow me as I follow Christ. You see, the, 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 the proper leadership always extends the, the invitation to follow. But ultimately, it's to follow the Lord Jesus. And so whether it's myself up here, or in days gone by, Kyle stood here, or Kelly, or, or Steve Yates, or Pastor Theo, or next week, Deshaun White, whoever it is, we honor the man of God by offering them your full attention as they make much of the Son of God, not of themselves. And it does not make a difference who it is. If they point you to Jesus, then they're a proper leader. Sit under their authority. Sit under their authority. Whether you like their style or not means nothing. You're honoring the message when you honor the messenger. That's what you do. He may not be your favorite orator, but he's God's man delivering God's message. Now, this last thing I want to address real quickly before we close is this idea here where he says, and it seems like a good thing. He says, some say, I follow only Christ. That seems good, doesn't it? We should follow Christ. Absolutely. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, that all of you together are Christ's body and each of us is part of it. So when it says, I follow only Christ, there's a problem because there's no lone rangers in the Christian body. 
No one's ever been called out of the church. You can't be called out of the church if you're part of the church. You're in the church. See, you can, you can learn on your own. God can speak to you, for sure. You open up your Bible, his words right there, he'll speak to you, right? You can pray, and he'll speak to you. You can do those things. But to say, I only follow Christ, see, there's a problem. Because Christ himself has placed some people in your life that he has chosen to speak to you through them. Do you understand? Here, let me tell you what I'm talking about. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. These are the gifts Christ gave to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why did he do this? Because he's going to speak to the people through these people. So you can't say, I only follow Jesus. You have to say that I'm following Paul as he follows Christ. And I shudder to say my name in that, but that's just the way it is. I don't like talking about it. It, it bugs me. But that's what it says. In Hebrews 13, 7, it says, to obey spiritual leaders and do as they say. Why? Because God has placed them in your life to speak on his behalf into your life. And so you can't say, I follow only Christ. I want to listen to anybody. You're not teachable. You're not truly following Christ if the man of Christ is trying to speak to you and you will refuse it. You can't say, I'm following Christ. Good leaders always point you to Jesus. That's why Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. The word preacher is the great Greek word keruso. Kerus, and keruso is what he does. He's a herald. He's a preacher. He's a proclaimer. He's a town crier. He's proclaiming very important news. But it's, it's never of himself. See, town crier doesn't cry out about himself. He's crying out about something else or someone else. And that's what a preacher does. The leaders of the church have been charged with proclaiming the goodness of God to the people. Christ on the cross and him crucified. So, in closing, I just want to tell you that this, uh, there'll be many, many a drift you'll see in the Corinthian church. But, but tonight's drift, you see here, it's just, it's division. And I, I beg you all, let no division be within this church. Ever. Ever. It's the only way to please the Lord. You can't please the Lord with division. He said, let there be no divisions. And that doesn't necessarily mean taking half the congregation and splitting. That means even while you stay, there's no division. Love one another. Cooperate. <laughs> Think of each other as more important than the other. The church, once of us, once... We were not his people. Once you were not here in this church, but divinely placed here in the church, but then often selfishly dividing and dividing and dividing and weakening and weakening and weakening. And I plead with you, loved ones, let's not be that church. Let's not be that church.